This is Europe and the United States in the 20th century, and we are on lecture number 12, entitled Transatlantic Relations, Detente and West Germany's Ostpolitik. And this lecture really covers the late 60s through to the end of the 1970s, a period in the Cold War which witnessed a relaxation of tensions between the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, and this period often referred to as the detente period in the relationship. Detente, of course, uh, for some reason in English, we use the French words to describe this period, which, which translates roughly into relaxation. So this was a period of relative stability or a strengthening of stability in the relationship between the two superpowers. Uh, quite when it begins is open for debate. Certainly you can see some tentative moves in the direction towards a new understanding between the United States and the Soviet Union. So if you recall in the last lecture, we talked a little bit about uh, how uh, NATO responded to the French withdrawal from NATO's military structures in 1966. One way they responded was to do a review, I suppose, of NATO's purpose, and named after, I think it was the Belgian, I can't remember, that was it, the Belgian Defence Minister or Foreign Minister, Harmel, um, which suggested that one of the chief reasons for NATO should be um, to try and stabilise the political relationship between the two superpowers. So it, all, so it explicitly advocated the idea that part of NATO's mission, aside from its obviously core military function, but part of NATO's mission should be to try and uh, um, engage with the Eastern Bloc in an effort to try and, as I say, stabilise the relationship. It does, though, very much become the centrepiece of the Nixon administration's foreign policy after 1969. And I would say the Nixon administration... Um, in the, as I say, from 69 through until Nixon's resignation in 1974. Uh, Nix, the Nixon administration elevates detente policies very much uh, as part of its national security strategies. So while there's certainly been other periods of a relative thaw in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, such as uh, immediately after Stalin's death in 1953, perhaps a brief of thaw after the Cuban Missile Crisis in, in uh, October 1962. I think this, I think what sets the Nixon administration apart from previous um, American uh, foreign policy strategies was that they pursued detente policies in a fairly systematic way. There's only at least one historian, John Lewis Gaddis, has argued that it effectively becomes part of the Nixon administration's sort of containment strategy. And we'll talk a little bit about how um, Nixon and particularly his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, uh, view detente as, uh, as a way of managing relations with the communist bloc. First of all, I mean, why does detente happen? Well, the third point on this book, on this bullet points here, I think gives the, in some ways the most simplest explanation. And that is both superpowers, um, late 60s, early 70s, wanted a relaxation of tensions. In other words, both the United States and the Soviet Union viewed it as in their best interests to try and improve relations with with one another and i think the main reason for that it was the changed international environment in the late 1960s early 1970s um, in particular both superpowers were experiencing a significant foreign policy problem in the case of the united states it's obviously the war in Vietnam, which by the late 60s, it's becoming increasingly evident that the war is not going well. And eventually, uh, both Johnson and then Nixon, who becomes president, commit themselves to finding a way to end the war. Um, in, in, sorry, in Nixon's formulation, this was this idea that the United States should, should withdraw, but Nixon wanting to secure peace with honour. In other words, acceptable terms for an American withdrawal. 
and there is a belief in the nixon administration that perhaps the soviet union could potentially help them achieve this um so that is one reason i think why the nixon administration decides that perhaps some kind of diplomatic approach and diplomatic uh, initiative with the soviets might be rather amenable the soviets also have their own particular foreign policy challenge in their case it's communist china by the late 1960s relations between the soviet union and china despite both of them being communist countries had kind of broken down to the point at which by 1969 the two countries are virtually at war there's a there's a series of border skirmishes uh, along the soviet chinese border um, so from the perspective of the Soviets, again, it makes sense to try and stabilise their relations with the United States, given the fact that they now have another major adversary with whom they are having to contend uh, in the East. So both Vietnam for the United States and China for the Soviet Union are two major contributory factors as to why, as I say, both the Soviets and the Americans feel that uh, it is in their own best interests to try and uh, work start working together there are other factors there again which this slide uh, mentions uh, the first point there i mentioned is american economic weakness which again we've touched on before um, um, and this is partly reflected in 1971 when you have the nixon shock where the nixon administration almost unilaterally with no consultation with its uh, european partners announces that the us dollar will be delinked from gold and, hence, and effectively bringing an end to the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rate rates which had underpinned the international financial system since the second world war um, and that could be interpreted and was certainly interpreted at, in, in the beginning of the 1970s as an indication that that america's uh, uh, relative uh, financial and economic position was beginning to uh, was beginning to slip. Another important factor was um, the nuclear arms race. By the late 60s, certainly by 1970, the Soviet Union had more or less achieved a position of parity when it came to strategic nuclear missiles. Um, they very quickly increased their stockpile in the late 60s there's a statistic there i can't remember exactly where i got this from but presumably uh from one of the readings on our reading list um but it says here you know 1967 570 intercontinental ballistic missiles so these are strategic nuclear missiles uh, uh the soviets were in possession of uh by 1969 so a mere two years later the soviet stockpile had virtually doubled up to 1050. Uh, then you've got the personality of Nixon himself. I mean, Nixon, maybe we'll talk a little bit about Nixon and his biography and where he came from and all the rest of it in our, in our, uh, um, in our discussion class. Um, but I think it's fair to say that Nixon does have this desire to appear to, as a great statesman. Um, in the early 70s he was very much it has to be said a foreign policy president and foreign policy was his major preoccupation and then from I would say you know 1972 onwards you've got the mounting scandal of Watergate which we don't need to go into to, into any detail now um, but eventually of course it overwhelms his presidency and Nixon is forced to resign in disgrace in 1974 to date the only American president to actually relinquish office in this manner so what did detente involve uh, first and foremost I would suggest is superpower summary in particular there were several very high profile meetings between nixon and his soviet counterpart the chairman of the soviet communist party leonard brezhnev there's a photograph here of them clinking champagne um, they meet each other um, on three different occasions there are three major summits the first one taking place in moscow so nixon I, I'm almost certain, I should have checked, but I'm almost certain Nixon is the first American president. 
to actually set foot, set foot in communist Russia during the Cold War. So there's this historic meeting in 1972, a few weeks after Nixon's visit to China. We'll talk about, we'll mention that in passing in a moment. Um, then there's a follow-up meeting the following year in 1973. This time Brezhnev travels to Washington and visits the United States. Um, and then 1974, which of course is the year of Nixon's resignation, but there is a final meeting. By this point, it's becoming clear that Nixon's presidency is in grave danger. Um, but as I say, there is a third meeting between the two men. And as I say, so superpower summitry, as I say, is probably one of the most salient aspects. I should say, you know, these were the meetings between the two statesmen, but of course there were many uh, you know, these meetings between heads of government were merely the culmination of lots and lots of meetings and negotiations between more junior officials, which were going on, um, 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 if not continuously, then for, you know, protracted periods, let's say. Okay, um, the slide indicating some of the agreements, this is not exhaustive. Um, actually, when you look at the detente period, one thing that is striking is that, yes, there are an awful lot of um, agreements uh, between uh, the two superpowers and various other parties in this period as well. Um, but I mentioned a few here. First of all, a 1971 trade agreement should be said trade uh, was certainly an important aspect of detente. Um, United States agreeing to sell $136 million worth of grain to the Soviet Union. Again, this will be, you know, this is quite important and uh, we will be coming back to the uh, 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 America's trade in grain with the Soviets uh, um, a little later. Um, even more significantly though, you have the first strategic arms limitation talks agreement, sorry, I'm getting that wrong, strategic arms limitation treaty. Um, agreements. This is SALT 1 in 1972 and this is signed in between Nixon and Brezhnev in Moscow. There's also a separate anti-ballistic missile treaty which is an ABM treaty which is signed roughly the same time. So obviously um, arms control becomes a really important aspect of detente. You have SALT 1 in 1972 and then SALT 2 in 1979, this time signed between Brezhnev and Carter. Um, should be, it's important to note, these were arms control agreements, not arms reduction. So each treaty um, established ceilings, so limits to the number of strategic nuclear weapons both superpower could have. Um, in fact, the SALT 1 agreement was almost obsolete by the time it had, almost immediately after it was signed, simply because by 1972, the United States, the technology had sort of moved on. Um, and again, without wishing to get too, too much, too, too detailed in all of this, but by this point, the United States had developed what were known as multiple independent re-entry vehicles or MIRVs on their warheads, which basically allowed them to put multiple warheads on each strategic missile, um, so uh, which you know, which SALT one did not, you know, did not take this into consideration. SALT two does in 1979. As I say, there's Washington summit 1970, uh, 1973, and this results in the signing of the Prevention of Nuclear War Agreement. And the following year, you have the Moscow summit. This is Nixon's final meeting with Brezhnev as president. Um, and it was literally within weeks of the Watergate crisis cascading over him, leading to his resignation. So by this stage, I think both the Americans and the Soviets knew that uh, Nixon's time in office was beginning to draw to a close, as I say, as a consequence of the mounting scandal. At the beginning of his presidency, Nixon actually issued one foreign policy declaration which had a significant impact on America's relations with its European allies as well as with Japan and other countries which had friendly relations with the United States. This was the so-called Nixon Doctrine um, which Nixon issues um, during a visit to the Pacific, I think it's on the, uh, I think it's on the uh, Pacific Island Guam, that uh, Nixon uh, makes this statement 
And as we can read here, the United States will participate in the defense and the development of allies and friends, but America cannot and will not conceive all the plans, design and programs, execute all the decisions and undertake the, all the defense of the free world. We will help where it makes a real difference and it is considered in our interest. Basically, what Nixon is saying here is that he envisaged the United States making a smaller contribution in terms of America's involvement in world affairs, including the defense of Western Europe, and that he expected uh, America's allies to do more. Now, the context for this was actually the war in Vietnam. As I say, it's no accident that Nixon makes this statement um, in the Pacific. Um, and one of Nixon's key policies was this idea of Vietnamization, this idea of beginning to withdraw American forces from Vietnam um, and get the South Vietnamese government to take up more of the burden, an increasing amount of the burden to the point at which perhaps the United States could withdraw from Vietnam altogether. Um, but this statement also basically envisaged um, how the Europeans might actually uh contribute uh to the you know, to, to 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 this sort of greater effort if i can put it that way now again the financial context economic and financial context late 60s early 70s is important here so america's finances had deteriorated quite markedly during the late 1960s um so this is a reflection i suppose of america's more straightened circumstances but burden sharing, this idea that the Europeans should be contributing more to the defence of Europe, that had been an issue that had plagued transatlantic relations really from, I suppose, the inception of NATO onwards. Um, but this was an issue that was becoming increasingly acute in the 1970s. And the Nixon doctrine basically reflects American concern on this issue. Um, as the first point here makes as well, um, the Nixon administration decided that the United States would have to reduce its overall sort of military capacity. So you see a reduction in terms of American national security strategy to one that envisaged the United States being able to fight a one and a half war. So one major war and, and a half a war. Uh, until then, the, uh, uh, the strategy had, had been based upon the idea that the United States would be able to fight two wars simultaneously. Um, furthermore, Nixon is the first president to really make a direct link between the United States' contribution to European security and American access to the European market. Um, so again, a quotation here from Nixon, you know, the Europeans cannot have it both ways. In other words, they could not rely on the United States to protect them whilst simultaneously partially excluding the United States from the European market through tariffs and things like that. Um, and again, that's significant because as we've already discussed until the 1970s, um, successive American administrations throughout the 1950s and 1960s had, had very much promoted the idea of European integration and had been willing to tolerate a degree of European discrimination against um, American imports to uh, the European market. This was beginning to change and again as I say this I think is a reflection of the sort of changed uh, economic and financial situation of the early 1970s. For their part, um, the Europeans, I think, display mounting concern about the Nixon administration's foreign policies, especially in relation to the Soviet Union. Um, and as Lundestad makes this point, but you can find it elsewhere, uh, that European governments were basically worried that the United States and the Soviet Union might start negotiations and effectively exclude the Europeans from this process. There's a sort of nagging doubt that maybe the United States and the Soviets could do some kind of deal at the, at the Europeans' expense. Um, and he, I think it's notable, I think one article on the reading list, I think it's the Hamilton article of the Year of Europe. I mean, it's, it's notable even the British, who in some ways are America's most reliable partner, or at least closest partner in, in, in Europe. Uh, were exhibiting doubts about 
the Nixon administration's new approach towards the Soviet Union. Um, European concerns are also strengthened by the fact that the political situation in the United States uh, was becoming more complicated. In particular, Senator Mike Mansfield, I think he was a Democrat senator, starts tabling a series of resolutions in the United States Senate, basically calling for either substantial reductions in the American military presence in Europe, or even perhaps a complete withdrawal. So this suggests that isolationist sentiment in American politics, which had never entirely vanished, but isolationist sentiments were beginning to gain ground in the United States. Um, one of these resolutions is only very narrowly defeated in the United States Senate. The Nixon administration has to work pretty hard to make sure that this is voted down. Um, one contributory factor as to why none of these resolutions pass is actually that Brezhnev uh, proposes, the Soviet leader Brezhnev actually proposes this idea of mutual balanced force reductions, um, that perhaps the United States and the Soviet Union should agree to negotiate uh, um, you know, mutual reductions in ground forces in Europe. Um, and that gives the Nixon, Nixon administration the opportunity to essentially say to the Senate, look, it's pointless us unilaterally withdrawing our forces if we can negotiate some kind of bilateral deal with the Soviet Union. Um, Brezhnev's intervention at the time was widely thought to be a sort of mistake on the Soviets' part, that you know they were on the brink of achieving, as I say, a unilateral American military withdrawal from Western Europe. And then Brezhnev sort of pops up and makes this proposal, which both, which gives the Nixon administration the excuse to simply say, look, a unilateral withdrawal isn't going to be necessary. Um, I think I've read, I've, I, 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 I can't remember exactly where I saw this, unfortunately, otherwise I would provide you with a reference. Uh, but I've certainly seen it, see, I've certainly seen it suggested somewhere that actually Brezhnev's intervention was a calculated move simply because he felt that a unilateral American withdrawal might actually be potentially quite destabilizing. Um, and Brezhnev, I think it's fair to say, was pretty conservative in his foreign policy views. So actually, you know, this wasn't, you know, certainly Brezhnev did not consider this to be some sort of faux pas or mistake, uh, but actually as such a sort of calculated move on his part. Um, but yeah, as I say, the spectre of an American withdrawal, the spectre of significant American reductions in its military presence, this is something that also, I think, alarms the Europeans in the early 1970s. Even the French under Pompidou are, not in, are certainly not happy about the idea of America kind of withdrawing um, its military presence from Western Europe. Then there's also the war in Southeast Asia that the United States is fighting. And I think it's fair to say this also creates strains in the relationship between the United States and the Europeans. It's notable, for instance, that none of the Europeans are willing to overtly support the war in Vietnam. Even Britain, which again, you know, the British government, it's the conservative government in the early 1970s, which is, is, is generally you know, thought to be you know, Conservatives generally thought to be the more pro-American of the two major British parties. Even the Conservatives can't bring themselves to come out and overtly support um, um, what the Americans are doing in Vietnam. They certainly make it clear that they are unwilling to uh, countenance the idea of sending any British military forces to fight. So this is the circumstances in the early 1970s and then 1973, which proves to be a pretty turbulent year in terms of international politics. But at the beginning of the year, the Nixon administration issues a new declaration in which they say 1973 is going to be the year of Europe. So we have here, we have this is a uh, quotation from Henry Kissinger, who at this stage was Nixon's national security advisor. We have been to the People's Republic of China. We have been to the Soviet Union. We have been paying attention to the problems of Europe, but now these problems will be put on the front burner. Um, the reference, of course, to China and the Soviet Union were Nixon's two visits in 1972, which were thought to be 
kind of groundbreaking major foreign policy initiatives. It was the first time the American president had set foot in either country. Um, but I think there's a sort of, again, a sort of mounting concern in among the Europeans that the United States was preoccupied with its diplomacy uh, in these parts of the world and was neglecting its relations with them. So the year of Europe was an attempt by the United States to assuage European concerns, if you like, about this. I think the European reaction, well, before we get on to that, I think the European reaction to this is somewhat divided. Some countries, especially Britain, Britain, of course, 1973, had recently become a member of the European community. So Britain actually joins the European community at the beginning of 1973. Um, and the British government, as I mentioned, is a conservative government, but back then the conservatives were the more pro-European of the two parties. Hard to envisage that now, I know, but, it, but, but, but that was the case back then. Um, and the British Prime Minister especially was quite eager to strengthen Britain's relations with its new European partners. Um, and this becomes a factor in terms of Britain's relations with the United States and the way that it responds to some of the events of 1973, which we will get on to now. Um, another quotation there, Henry Kissinger during a meeting with Mao Zedong and Xu Enlai of the Chinese leadership. And a quotation here, Europe has very weak leadership right now. They can't do anything anyway. They are basically irrelevant. I think of the two quotations, I think this is probably the more sort of revealing or the more uh, accurate in terms of representing American attitudes uh, when it comes to, or the Nixon administration's attitudes when it comes to uh, their relations with their European partners. Um, yeah, going back to the EU, as I said, the reaction is somewhat mixed. Uh, I say the British quite keen, I suppose, although, you know, as I say, very keen to maintain a sort of close working relationship with their new European partners, but also quite keen for there to be some kind of transatlantic connection between the, the between what was then the European community and the United States. Um, on the other hand, some European countries sort of react fairly dismissively to this idea that 1973 was the year of Europe. I think the French attitude was was long, oh really, you're going to give us a year, are you? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Nixon and Kissinger. Um, so as I say, some Europeans more willing to embrace the idea of the year of Euro Europe than others. Nonetheless, there are a series of meetings um, in which uh, it says the third point work proceeded on two joint United States. I say that EU, that's a mistake. It should be EC, of course. The European Union was some way away. So, uh, in fact, we need to be aware of that. It was a European community back then. Um, but yeah, the two, two kind of statements are sort of drawn up uh, in which the United States and the Europeans sort of commit themselves to sort of working together. Again, the Europeans are quite divided as to how, as in terms of how much of a transatlantic connection that they want. The French in particular were very wary of bringing the United States, giving the United States some kind of role when it comes to the inner mechanisms, the inner workings, if you like, of the European community. The British, in contrast, were more inclined to actually work constructively, let's say, with the United States in this period. The problem with all of this, though, is I suppose the two big things that unfold during 1973. One is the mounting political crisis inside the United States as a result of the Watergate scandal, which ultimately, of course, uh, scuppers uh, uh, Nixon's presidency. Um, I think certainly by the autumn of 1973, it was becoming increasingly clear that, 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 that Nixon was going to be quite unlikely to survive politically. Um, then added to that, you have a major war blowing up in the Middle East, October 1973, what the Israelis call the Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur War. I think Egypt and sort of Arab states, Muslim states, refer to it as the Ramadan 
the war in during Ramadan, uh, the more neutral term, I suppose, is the October War. Either way, a, a major war breaks out in 1973. In many ways, it's a sort of replay of the 1967 war. Um, and again, we don't need to go into the ins and outs of the war, war itself. Suffice to say that European and American reactions to the war are somewhat different. The Americans, unsurprisingly, come down heavily in support of Israel. Um, they're in some way you know, a relatively new friend of the United States. Relations between America and Israel haven't always been that warm, but by 1973, Israel obviously was beginning to be seen in Washington as um, as a, a you know as as a significant friendly state in the region, the Europeans. Well, the Europeans' main preoccupation is to try and secure their oil supply. Oil supply. So as the price of oil shoots up as a consequence of this Middle Eastern powers, um, the Europeans, including the British and the French, uh, were reluctant to do anything that might destabilize their relations with uh, other Arab states, with other Arab oil producing states. One consequence of this is that the Europeans actually refuse to allow the United States the use of bases, um, air bases in Europe in order to supply the Israelis. And it's notable even the British refuse an American request to allow to allow their bases to be used. And again, I think that's also sort of a reflection of the fact that uh, 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 you know, the Europeans basically did not want to do anything that would upset their relations with the uh, with the with the Arab states at this point. Um, moreover, uh, the United States issues a nuclear alert without consulting their European partners. We now know it was actually Kissinger's decision. By this point, Nixon is basically in the White House in a drunken stupor, ruminating about Watergate and his various enemies. Um, so it's Kissinger who, rather unconstitutionally, was making some of the key decisions. And it is Kissinger who decides to send a signal to the Soviets not to intervene in the Middle East by upgrading America's nuclear alert status, um, including American forces in Europe. This also worries Europe, the Europeans. They think this is an overtly and unnecessarily aggressive act. Um, I say there, the final point, that by the mid-1970s, transatlantic relations seem to have destabilised. There's actually a very good article on the reading list by P.S. Ludlow, uh, which talks about the various ways. And again, I'm, I don't really have time to go into it in too much detail, but maybe we'll save it. So some discussion for uh, uh, for next for the for our discussion class. Um, but he makes the point that by 75 76 relations between the United States and its European partners actually do improve quite significantly. Indeed, the, the article is entitled, uh, I think it's 1975, The Real Year of Europe. Um, and there are several reasons for this. One, Nixon's out of the way. Uh, and I think Ford, uh, who briefly is Nixon's vice president before taking the main job. Um, Ford was a more, let's say, kind of consensual figure and somebody who was more inclined to work with other countries. And it, well, and this, to some extent, is sort of reflected in some of the sort of emerging transatlantic institutions which appear in the mid 1970s. One of the most significant is what was first the G5 and later becomes the G7, uh, which is an informal working group of of um, uh, several industrialized states um, involving obviously the United States, Canada, Japan, and you know several European countries. One of the points Ludlow makes is that the Europeans are actually strongly overrepresented in these bodies. So suddenly you have what is it three, four uh, France. Germany, West what was then West Germany, obviously Britain, Italy. So yeah, four four European countries sitting around the table. All of them, of course, um, now inside the Europe, European Community. So that you know that is quite significant. Um, 
So yeah, as I say, after Nixon's departure, the transatlantic relationship does seem to improve somewhat. So these are the wider international developments, the wider context, if you like, in which the West German government begins to pursue a radical new departure in its diplomacy, which comes to be known as Ostpolitik. Uh, that is, of course, Germany's Eastern policy. Um, before I go through the points, I think it's worth just making a qu quick just provided provide a little bit of context. We talked about Germany before, and we talked about Germany's division. So we mentioned the fact that in 1949, Germany is divided, a West German state is constructed, uh, Konrad Adenauer becomes West Germany's first chancellor. Um, the Soviets established their sort of mirror image German state, communist government, the German Democratic Republic in the East, um, and that's the situation through the 1950s and the 1960s. Now, again, before I get on to Ostpolitik per se, it's just a couple of things need to be said about West Germany's official position, let's say, towards the East. First thing to say about West Germany is the West Germans claim to be the legitimate German government, or to put it another way, they claim basically to be the government that represents the whole of the German nation. So they do not regard East Germany as being a legitimate state. Okay, So that's the first thing to say about uh, uh, West German policy. The next thing to say, I think I mentioned this before, but West German policy basically becomes NATO policy. And actually it's a sort of indication of just how much weight that the West Germans have within NATO, that their, you know, their German policy, as it were, basically becomes NATO's German policy. So ne other, you know, other European countries, Germany's NATO partners, plus the United States, simply accept the German view that the East German state, the communist East Germany, is fundamentally illegitimate. Another really important aspect to this, though, is that the West Germans not only refuse to recognize East Germany itself, but they also refuse to recognize any other government which has diplomatic relations with East Germany. And this becomes known as the Hallstein Doctrine. So in effect, if you walked into the West German Foreign Office in the 1950s and put up a big map of Europe, um, anything east of the uh, of the uh, River Oder uh, was simply uh, actually not River Oder. What am I saying? That's the that's the eastern frontier. Sorry, uh, anything east of uh, whatever Frankfurt uh, basically was not uh, uh, you know was not going to be recognised. Okay, so there would be a sort of big blank space. Um, so in practice, this basically means that these that the West Germans do not have any di diplomatic official relationship with any country in the Eastern Bloc. Um, and as I say, what is West German policy also becomes effectively NATO policy. Um, the only exception to this rule is the Soviet Union itself. In 1955, diplomatic relations are actually established between the Federal Republic of Germany, that is West Germany, and the Soviet Union. Ardenauer makes, you know, fairly um, significant, quite a significant trip to Moscow in 1955. He does this. The reason why they, why the West Germans decide in 1955 to make an exception to the Soviet Union, I should say this is in response to a Soviet overture. I mean, the Soviets reach out to the West Germans, point out that, you know, in previous periods of their history, the Germans and the Russians had worked together. They mentioned things like Rapallo. Perhaps they don't mention the Nazi Soviet pact, but anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, they point this out and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe it would be in both countries' uh, interests to sort of resume this kind of relationship. In particular, the Soviets wanted uh, um, sort of access to the West German market in terms of trade, access to West German technology. So reluctantly, Ardenauer decides that, yes, maybe, you know, maybe the West Germans will make an exception in the case of the Soviet Union. He travels and he does so for two reasons. As I say, one, there's a general recognition that the Soviet Union is simply too big to ignore. 
I mean, you don't necessarily have to have diplomatic relations with Bulgaria, but pretending the Soviet Union doesn't exist is going to be a, is going to be rather more difficult. Secondly, though, and perhaps even more significantly, there is a recognition in Bonn that if Germany is ever to be unified, um, Moscow will need to consent to that. So the keys of West, the keys of Germany's unification very much lie in Moscow. You know, they are very much in the hands of the Soviet Union. And so it makes sense to have some kind of official contact with uh, uh, with with, uh, with the Soviet Union. A third factor is that Adenauer, when he turns up in Moscow in 1955, the, the Germans are sort of half hoping. Well, maybe more than half hoping, but they're hoping that to get um, German prisoners of war. It's 10 years after the war, there were still German prisoners of war in the Soviet Union. So Ardenauer sort of turns up, and this is one of his demands. Um, and actually, the meeting is somewhat awkward, to say the least, because Ardenauer says, look, I want these guys back. And then he says, how many have you got? And Soviet delegation sort of shifts uneasily and then have to admit that actually there aren't that many left. You know, after 10 years of captivity, a significant percentage have simply just uh, disappeared, as it were, uh, which, you know, causes a great deal of kind of shock and consternation. Uh, but the few that remain um, are, you know, are sent back home um, in, in, uh, in, in 1955. Okay, that's basically the context. So, as I say, policy basically of non-recognition of East Germany but also non-recognition of the communist bloc as a whole with the only real exception being the Soviet Union and this policy as I say becomes NATO policy but and again there's a couple of articles on the reading list which uh, um, talk about this um, various countries within NATO were, were beginning to be less than happy with this approach there's a general feeling that this policy of non-recognition was doing nothing to sort of ease east-west tensions or doing nothing to sort of move, move things forward, as it were. Eisenhower criticizes, Kennedy criticizes, although neither of them really are, are willing to sort of break with the West Germans on this uh, on this issue. The British too, which come to, I mean, the British come, come to favor sort of detente policies from a relatively early stage. You know, the British too are basically unhappy with the West German position. Um, but it also becomes increasingly controversial within West Germany itself. And in particular, several senior figures in the Social Democrats begin to question this wisdom of non-recognition. Um, and Willy Brandt, who is perhaps the big, most important uh, Social Democratic politician in West German politics, he begins to start revising his view. Brandt, Brandt is basically mayor of West Berlin when the war goes up in 1961 and this has a really big impact on Brandt and he basically starts to think well is this is this policy of non-recognition serving us particularly well, particularly well. We talked a little bit about Ardenauer and the fact that you know he comes from Cologne he um, you know, he, he doesn't have a sort of psychological connection with the East. Well, in contrast, Brandt, as I say, he, he'd been mayor of Berlin. He, he, you know, he was somebody whose connections with the East were much, you know, were much more uh, um, prominent than those of, uh, than those, than, than those of Ardenau. And as I say, it's Brandt who begins to sort of question it. Then in 1966, there's a West German election. Um, and for the first time, you have a grand coalition government made up of the Christian Democrats, uh, who are the larger party. And uh, it is uh, Kurt Keisinger, I think, who becomes the West German Chancellor in these years. Uh, but Willy Brandt, uh, who's leading the Social Democrats in this coalition, um, becomes foreign minister. And under Brandt, you do see the first steps what becomes, I think, what become what becomes what comes to be known as a policy of movement. So you have the first steps towards Ostpolitik, and a, a couple of decisions are made. First of all, I think oh, I always forget this. Um, I think West Germany they certainly diplomatically recognise Yugoslavia, and I think they also recognise Romania. Um, 
why these two particular countries? Obviously, both countries part of the communist bloc. So you can see the first sort of weakening, if you like, of the Hallstein doctrine. However, these were two countries which were non-aligned. You know, these were two countries which had effectively broken with the Soviet Union. So it was so. Yes, they are part of the communist bloc, but they are not actually fully entrenched within the Soviet Empire per se. But it's again, as I say, it's an important step towards uh, uh, the sort of weakening of the Hallstein Doctrine. Um, also, trade missions are established with a number of East European countries, including, I think, Poland um, in this period. So we're talking about the late 1960s here. Um, so suddenly you do have some form of West German official uh, uh, official representation, if you like, in the Eastern Bloc. Now, this is a lot less than full diplomatic recognition, but nonetheless, it's again, it's a sort of important step in towards the weakening of the Hallstein Doctrine. There's also the fact that the Hallstein Doctrine was becoming increasingly untenable, simply because more and more countries throughout the world were recognizing East Germany. And I think the crunch point comes late 1960s when it's becoming clear that India, again, massive country in the developing world, obviously, but India was probably going to recognize communist East Germany. Uh, and there's a sort of recognition among the West Germans that if that happens, that again, India is too big to ignore. So the Hallstein Doctrine is probably just not going to be viable for much longer. Anyway, there's an election in 1969 and it results in the formation of a social democratic government, despite the fact that the social democrats don't win the most seats. The Christian Democrats win the most seats, but Brandt manages to persuade a smaller party, whose name I've forgotten, <laughs> um, I think it's the Free Democrats, isn't it, um, to enter into a coalition with him um, in order to form a new government. So for the first time in its history, um, you have a, a new, a social democ the Social Democrats come into government uh, as, uh, as, as, as the leading party in a coalition, and, and Brandt becomes the first uh, Social Democratic Chancellor. Um, that's significant, not least, I, I, I think it's worth stressing, because until then, the United States had very, very close relations with the Christian Democrats. So I think the Americas, I think Nixon more or less says this uh, in private conversations, that the Christian Democrats are America's party. So suddenly they got a, they've got a new guy in Bonn uh, who is much less tightly connected, let's say, to to uh, to, to the American um, administration. Um, and as Chancellor in 1969, it's basically Brandt who unleashes this new policy that becomes known as Ostpolitik. So he sort of builds upon this policy of movement in the late 1960s, but suddenly um, the intensity, let's say, of West Germany's activity uh, activities towards the east increases quite significantly. Okay, what was Ostpolitik? Right, going back to what we said a moment ago. So we, we talked about this previous policy of non-recognition. Um, and basically, you know, under Ardenauer, um, the policy of West Germany is unification, then detente. So under Ardenauer, the policy, you know, the West German policy is unification first, and then we can have detente. Um, so recognition of the Eastern Bloc was going to be contingent on unification. As I say, Brandt becomes increasingly critical, and not just Brandt, but there's a feeling that this, you know, that, that this policy simply isn't working, that, that by the late 1960s, Germany, West Germany is no closer to unification than it had been in the late 1940s. Um, so basically, Brandt reverses this policy and pursues a policy. I can, can't say it in German. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a cumbersome uh, phrase in German. But uh, you can find the translation yourself. But um, uh, he pursues a policy, but basically though, of unification through detente. In other words, 
West Germany would start implementing detente policies in order to try and effect an improvement of relations with the Eastern Bloc. And through this process, they would be able to create the conditions which would allow unification to become uh, um, a real possibility. Um, so this basically is Ostpolitik. As I say, it's West Germany's own version of detente, and it basically envisages this idea of intensifying West Germany's contacts to the East. In doing so, that would improve relations and ultimately it would create the conditions which would allow for unification. They think this is going to be a very long term process. And part of the inspiration for this is what has happened in Western Europe in the 1950s and 1960s, where you have this German, Franco German reconciliation. So, you know, Brandt and others are saying, look, we managed to do this in the West. Maybe we can do something similar in the East. Okay, so the overarching objective is German unification, but they think this is, this is something that's a, a very long term aim. You know, they're thinking in terms of decades. It's not something that's going to happen overnight, but over time, you know, a gradual, through a gradual process of engagement with the uh, the uh, um, the uh, um, with the Eastern Bloc, um, unification might well become possible. OK, second point here. Ostpolitik has three dimensions to it. Uh, I'm drawing upon Garton Ash's work here uh, and, and, and his book. It's one of my favorite books on contemporary European history. Um, and he basically says that there are these three distinct dimensions to Ostpolitik. First of all, you've got the bilateral relationship between West Germany and the Soviet Union itself. As we've mentioned, these contacts can be traced all the way back to 1955. In fact, some Christian Democrats try to make the argument that it's actually Ardenauer who, who begins the process of Ostpolitik. That, I think, is fairly tenuous at best. But nonetheless, you know, as I said, these contacts have been around for some time. Um, so you have West Germany's relations with the Soviets, um, then West Germany's relations with East Germany, and finally you've got West Germany's relations with the rest of the Eastern Bloc. So these three distinct dimensions. And Garten Ash basically argues that from this outset the West Germans pursue what becomes known as a Moscow first approach. So relations with the Soviet Union are prioritized. Again, as I say, it reflects this idea that the keys to German unification lie in Moscow. Um, Brand ops, as I say, a strategy of unification through detente. Um, and they basically, Brand makes it clear that he wants to work with the Soviets and he offers two um, to, no, three, I suppose, three inducements to the Soviets. He said, look, if you will work with us, first of all, he says, you know, you will get, you know, we are prepared to do deals which will allow you to get greater access to West German trade and technology. Um, and, you know, this idea, I suppose, had underpinned this wider version of detente, which the, which the Soviet Union was engaged with, the United States. Uh, the West Germans also say we'll also be prepared to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty, something that you know German conservatives had previously resisted. We've noted already that the Non-Proliferation Treaty was extremely controversial in West Germany. A number of West German conservatives, including Adenauer, disliked the Non-Proliferation Treaty intensely. Um, the Social Democrats much more amenable. In fact, the nuclear issue becomes quite because really important in terms of the internal uh, debate within the Social Democratic Party in the 1970s. Um, so Brandt basically says to the West Germans, you know, we will be prepared to sign the non-proliferation treaty. Again, something that the Soviets were quite, you know, were very keen on. They did not want uh, the Germans to gain any access to nuclear weapons. And finally, Brandt says we will also support the idea of some kind of European conference on security. Again, something that the Soviets have been pressing for for a few years, but which Western states have been resisting. Um, in terms of West German diplomacy, well, like the Nixon administration's um, 
version of detente with the Soviet Union, um, summitary and international treaties plays a really important role. Um, and the West Germans kick off in August 1970. So we're literally talking less than a year, I think, after, after Brandt becomes chancellor. Um, August 1970, a treaty is signed in Moscow, which is usually just referred to as the Moscow Treaty. And it's basically a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. So both the Soviets and the West Germans promise that they will not go to war, that they will not launch aggressive action against each other. Um, but it does contain a couple of quite important things, other things in it as well, in terms of West Germany's approach towards the East. First of all, I say point number three, it said so recognize the existence of the GDR. Looking at the PowerPoint again, I wrote this a few years ago, and I should have checked it. I, I, I would prefer to say there's a partial recognition in, in, the other, in the sense that for the first time in an official document, um, the, the West Germans acknowledge that East Germany exists. You know, the, the, I think, I think the, its title, the German Democratic Republic, appears in, the, in an official text, which, you know, which, which the West Germans have. So it's, again, it's not obviously, it's much, much less than full diplomatic recognition. It's not that, this, that, the, that, the, that the West Germans are sort of reaching out and acknowledging that East Germany is a, is a sovereign state in its own right. But as I say, they acknowledge it exists, which is, which you know, is is, is quite a significant step in terms of uh, of uh, West Germany's approach towards the East. Um, moreover, actually, this is something I forgot to mention earlier as well, uh, which I should have done. <laughs> um, point number two: the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, recognizes that Europe's frontiers are inviolable. So they basically recognize the post 1945 map of Europe which again is a major concession because up until this point West Germany's official policy had been that Germany's true frontiers were those of December 1937. Um, in other words again if you went into a map in the German Foreign Office and said what are Germany's frontiers you know they would point to the fact would point to the frontiers of December 1937. So this is obviously pre Nazi Germany's Anschluss with Austria and the annexation of the Sudetenland and and, uh, and Hitler's other sort of European conquests, but they basically say that um, Germany should still have um, the um, East Prussia, um, so the Polish corridor should be sort of divided, still dividing East Prussia from the rump of Germany, um, and you know various Eastern territories, uh, Silesia and places like that, which which. Uh, which Germany had lost as a result of the Second World War. So that was Germany's sort of official position up until 1970. Um, so this is a major concession Brand makes. He basically says, yeah, we recognise the post-1945 map of Europe, and we recognise that if Germany is ever to be united, um, its frontiers will be, as I say, the post-1945 frontiers. So in other words, Germany's eastern frontier was you know the current frontier between East Germany and Poland. Although they use a, a quite a significant word, they say the frontiers are inviolable, not permanent, inviolable. Inviolable basically means that they can only be changed through mutual consent. So both parties would have to agree to it. So West, West Germans are sort of leaving open the possibility of changes to the European map. But if that were to happen, it would, as I say, require the consent of you know, the consent of uh, all of the various governments involved. You know, they said that these frontiers can't be changed through the use of force. As I say, there's this partial recognition of the German Democratic Republic. And then a few months later, December 1970, there's a follow up treaty with Poland, which again explicitly recognizes the Polish East German frontier. So the West Germans say, if Germany is ever unified, you know, this will be basically our Eastern frontier. You know, we are not going to start making territorial claims uh, uh, um, east of the uh, east of the Oder Nice line. Um, 1971, then Honecker replaces, Eric Honecker replaces Walter Ulbricht as East German Chancellor. This is significant because Ulbricht had been 
pretty resistant to the idea of working with West Germany. The Soviets by the early 70s though have basically come, become more amenable to the idea of detente and they suggest that maybe it's time for the old guy to go and be replaced by young blood. Honecker, although an avowed Stalinist, nonetheless is much more amenable to the idea of cooperation with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with West Germany. Um, and the following year, a basic treaty is signed between the East Germans and the West Germans. Um, from the West German standpoint, it is not acknowledging that East Germany is a sovereign state in its own right. But again, it's back to what I said earlier. They sort of acknowledge that it exists. They acknowledge that there, you know, there is an East German state with an East German government and you know, they are willing to do business with it. But they don't, as I say, they don't confer full diplomatic recognition. So they don't regard it, let's say, as a foreign state in its own right. So significantly, although you know there are there is diplomatic recognition between East Germany and West Germany, uh, the institutions themselves are labelled as being high commissions, so not embassies. So again, there's some sort of ambiguity in terms of in in in, in terms of the relationship. Yes, you know they recognise there is an East German government, but as I say, it's something less than full outright diplomatic recognition of East German sovereignty but it's enough for both countries to finally become members of the United Nations in 1973 so basically the United States and the Soviets uh, no longer kind of block membership for each other's client states if I can put it that way um, another thing to mention is the full power or quadripartite treatment of Berlin which is signed in August 1971 um, that basically sort of recognises the status quo, that Berlin was going to remain divided. Um, but it was significant, not least because the West Germans make ratification of the Moscow Treaty contingent on a satisfactory four power agreement on Berlin, which basically left open the possibility of the United States or Britain or France for that matter blocking the Moscow Treaty by refusing to come to an agreement and there was again I, no time to go into the details but there was quite a lot of sort of diplomatic engagement between uh, the West Germans and the Americans on this and certainly the Nixon administration does give some consideration to the idea of basically torpedoing grants Ostpolitik by uh, refusing to come to an arrangement on Berlin, um, but in the end they can't quite bring themselves to do so. Um, quotation here, Philly Brandt talking about the Moscow Treaty in 1970, and he says, with this treaty nothing is lost that had not long since been gambled away. Again, he's talking about West Germany's recognition of its eastern of Germany's eastern frontiers and effectively saying look I am not you know we're basically acknowledging that we have lost the eastern territories uh, another time he says you know we accept the results of history you know in other words we're not getting East Russia back we're not getting Silesia back Both those territories have now been lost this is really really controversial inside West Germany though because there are plenty of people in West Germany who either had fled from the east themselves and had lost property, land, um, and who basically wanted one day to return to their homelands, or they had children who, you know, who, who, uh, who also, you know, had you know, recognised that they had sort of lost family property in the East. So it becomes it becomes actually quite a divisive issue in West German politics. It becomes partisan as well because the two parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, come pretty are pretty divided on this issue. And I think there's an election in West Germany in 1972, if I remember, or was it 73? Can't remember. Um, which basically becomes a sort of referendum on Ostpolitik. But the Social Democrats win it. So although, you know, that there is a lot of entrenched opposition to what they are doing, um, nonetheless, ultimately, as I say, the, uh, you know, the West Germans, sort of, uh, uh, so the Social Democrats win that election. Uh, 
Okay, in terms of the sort of wider external implications, there's a good quotation. I think I've taken this from the Lundestad book, actually. Um, United Nations Security Council, we should not conceal a longer range concern over the potentially divisive effect in the Western Alliance and inside Germany of and any excessively active German policy in Eastern Europe, as well as our concern over the potential risks of a crisis that such a policy might create in relations between Eastern European states and the USSR. Um, that quotation, I think, quite nicely encapsulates some of the concerns that the Americans have over, over West, German, West Germany's policy of us polity. Um, which again is interesting because basically the West Germans are doing something quite similar to what Nixon and Kissinger are doing in relation to the Soviet Union. But whereas you know Nixon and Kissinger are negotiating with the Soviets, signing treaties, doing all these other sorts of things, when the West Germans start pursuing similar policies, the Americans might very much come out against this, at least in private. And I think there's several reasons for that. First of all, I mean, I think the biggest reservation that Nixon and Kissinger have is that they dislike the new, more independent West German policy. Uh, the fact that the West Germans were now embarking upon this very grandiose diplomatic initiative and that they did not real, they were not fully, really consulting with Washington. So it's the more, it's the independent nature, I think, of West Germans' policies and the fact that, you know, they were, they were, um, unleashing this initiative with not much in the way of consultation. That that is something that uh, uh, Nixon and Kissinger find quite uh, de quite uh, quite problematic. In fact, you know, a number of historians have made this point about Nixon and Kissinger is that essentially, you know, they they they, they you, you, part of the goal of of Ospol, so part of the goal of detente is to achieve greater levels of stability. So there was this kind of underlying concern that maybe other countries, European allies or whoever, could could through their own policies start creating problems. So that's one factor. Um, there's also the fact that they there's a worry that perhaps Ostpolity ultimately be, might be quite destabilizing in several important ways. It could become destabilizing inside Germany. We talked about the sort of partisan divisions, um, but it could also be destabilizing in terms of the situation in Europe. Um, a number of other European countries, including Britain and France, have misgivings about West Germany's Ostpolitik. Um, it's partly because the Europeans always have a tendency to start worrying when the Germans and the Russians start working together and cooperating. Again, it's not, you know, the Nazi Soviet pact was you know, pretty fresh in many in the in the memories of many Europeans. So there is there is that. There's also a fear, despite the fact that Brown makes lots and lots of protestations to the contrary, but there's also a fear that Ostpolity might gradually lead to a weakening of West Germany's place within NATO. Um, so overall, as I say, there are reservations, quite significant reservations in the Nixon administration and in other European countries as well. I've seen some of the British records on this, for example, and uh, it's pretty clear that the British Prime Minister Edward Heath at that time was certainly was not an enthusiast for Ostpolitik. On the other hand, I mean, British misgivings couldn't be very clearly expressed in the early 1970s because the British were counting on West German support for their application to, for membership of the European community. So in other words, the British sort of have to swallow their reservations. Um, the French also aren't particularly happy with this new trend in West German policy. Um, and as I say, you know, Nixon and Kissinger also harbour significant reservations. Ultimately, you know, despite their scepticism, though, Nixon and Kissinger and others in the American government can't really bring themselves to come out and publicly challenge what Brandt is doing for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, it would obviously create a massive public schism within NATO if, if uh, uh, the Americans come out and publicly question uh, a major foreign policy initiative pursued by one of their most important uh, NATO allies. It's also the fact that Brandt himself was actually pretty popular uh, in Europe and in North America. Uh, in fact, I think Time magazine made Brandt Man of the Year, and I think Ostpolitik was generally viewed 
quite favorably in many you know in many courses in terms of public opinion insofar as you know, of what Brandt uh, of what Brandt was doing um there is a meeting i think i think lundestad quotes this as, i think it also appears in kissinger's memoirs so there's a meeting between nixon and brandt in 1973 at camp david and brandt sort of thanks nixon for america's support for us politique and nixon pointedly replies i didn't support it i just didn't oppose it you know again kind of revealing i suppose uh his sort of lack of enthusiasm for that so whilst politics becomes an important component, I'm sort of conscious that I've already spent quite a lot, lot, long time on this, so I'm going to quite skip through the next few slides pretty quickly and, and wind this up. Um, the next really important milestone there on, 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 uh, in, in terms of the detente period is the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, which is opened in 1973 in Helsinki and closes again in 1975 in Helsinki with the Helsinki Final Act. There is a really, really good article on the reading list, and I'm not going to summarise it all now, so I'll, I'll, I'll suggest you go off and read it, by, uh, Andrew, uh, by I think her name is Andrea Romano, um, in which she discusses, again, it, it's really good from for, for a rather perspective perspective because it goes into some of the sort of transatlantic um, um, differences, let's say, uh, when it comes to the approach on, of, on, on the conference of security and cooperation. Um, as I, I don't want to, I won't labour, I won't spend too much time now summarising, maybe, maybe we'll discuss her article in our, in our, in our seminar. Um, just very quickly though on the conference and as I, I, I should spend much, much much longer on this but disappearing so I, 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 i'll skip over it pretty quickly but as i say conference opens in 1973 i've already mentioned the soviets have been demanding this for some time um for various reasons above all they want sort of recognition of yalta europe as timothy garton ash puts it so you know basically the sort of status quo post-1945 situation in Europe, particularly when it comes to European frontiers. They also wanted access to Western trade and technology. Um, the negotiations start and there's a general feeling on the part of the Americans and the Europeans that if they are going to give, particularly the Europeans, it should be said, that if they are going to sort of grant these concessions, they need to have something in return. Um, so from the European point of view, they decide as part of this quid pro quo that the Soviets should make concessions when it comes to human rights. Congress opens in 1973, uh, and it basically involves all European states plus Canada and the United States. The only exception, I think, is Albania. I don't think they were particularly missed, to be honest. Uh, originally, the Soviets had demanded a purely European conference, but the Western Europeans insist that uh, North America, the conference itself, the Helsinki Final Act, which finally comes out in 1975, and it's divided into what were known as three baskets. Bas I don't know why they call them baskets, but basically three distinct sections in the document. Basket one um, refers to Europe's 1945, sorry, refers to Europe's post-1945 frontiers and like in the Moscow Treaty and subsequent treaties that the West Germans negotiate with the Eastern Bloc, it it mentions this word inviolable. So this word sort of recurs. It appears again incidentally in the Polish-German um, Friendship Treaty uh, after German unification in I think it's 1990. So this sort of, this word becomes something of a standard in these sorts of uh, documents. Should also be said, I mean, a lot of the language of detente and ospoli, uh, sorry, a lot of the language in the in the in the uh, in, in the documents also uh, use language which sort of recurs in, in 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 the sort of Soviet West German official documents in this period. Basket two deals with the trade and technological transfer, scientific exchange, stuff like that should also say about the Helsinki Final Act, you can find it very easily online. Just Google it. Um, it is quite a long document. It's quite a technical document. Um, it, it's uh, so, you know, they, they do you know, they do expend quite a lot of effort uh, producing this. Basket three refers to human rights and it includes certain fundamental rights, um, such as the right to worship, the right to go to you know a church. Um, the right to marry who you want to, I think, is included in it. Uh, also, greater access 
for journalists in the Eastern Bloc. This is also something that uh, you know, that um, uh, that uh, uh, the West demand. The Soviets agree to this. You know, they sign it, and I think it's fair to say they don't take the basket three provisions too seriously. Um, in their eyes, this is you know this, they are not making too much of a concession. They do so for for a couple of reasons. First of all, they simply think that. The human rights provisions. The language is a pretty vague and pretty, you know, pretty, pretty airy um, from their perspective, at least. Um, secondly, they think it's not going to be enforceable. Um, so, you know, again, we don't have to take it too seriously. Uh, and you know, if if the West dislike it, well, tough. Uh, furthermore, basket one on the, you know, which deals with sovereignty frontiers stuff like that it, it 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 contains a very classic statement of state sovereignty which basically just says that you know that, that there's an acknowledgement that there cannot be um intervention in the internal affairs of other states so the soviets can always point to you know basket one and say look you've got no right to criticize us you, you know you're you are intervening in our internal affairs so the Soviets kind of think that think this. Similarly, there are plenty of conservatives and people on the right who kind of share the Soviets' view on this. In particular, people like Margaret Thatcher, who had recently become leader of the opposition in Britain. She is very, very um, unenthused by the Helsinki Final Act. She thinks that the West has conceded far too much in return for far too little. Which I should instantly I should say that was also one of the criticisms that you know was made against West German Ostpolity that the West Germans as I say, had conceded far too much in the name of environment improvement, but weren't getting much in the way of substantive concessions from the Soviet Union. Um, Reagan goes on to talk about the Helsinki Final Act being a sort of another yalta again, and so yeah, that the West had conceded far too much to 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 the Soviets. Interestingly, though, both Thatcher and Reagan actually make a great deal use of the Helsinki Final Act as a way of attacking the Soviet Union, um, and ultimately, I think many, many historians have argued that Helsinki actually does become. An, an important factor in eroding Soviet legitimacy in the Eastern Bloc. Partly, as I say, it's because Western leaders kind of wave Helsinki under the, under the nose of the Soviets and accuse them of not upholding basic human rights. Um, but also opposition movements in East Euro Eastern Europe, uh, such as Solidarity in Poland, which is sort of beginning to emerge in this period, Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia, they too sort of seize upon Helsinki and again, use the document as a way of attacking their communist rulers, attacking communist rulers, saying that you are not living up to your promises. And this, you know, over time, you know, Helsinki almost becomes a sort of ticking bomb for the Eastern Bloc. As I say, it, it you, know, you know, the Soviets are rather blasé in 1975, but ultimately you could argue that they, that they basically give the West and opposition groups in Eastern Europe a very significant weapon in which to undermine their rule, undermine their presence uh, in the in the region. Okay, moving on quickly. 1977, uh, Jimmy Carter becomes president of the United States. So poor old Gerald Ford uh, loses to Carter in the 1976 election. Carter's main message in the 76 campaign was that he was not Richard Nixon and that proves to be more than enough to guarantee victory. Um, comes in, Carter is very much a liberal, he's a democrat, somebody who was broadly supportive of detente policies but you have this sort of irony that it's under his presidency that detente basically unravels in the late 1970s um comes in at a point in american history where there's a considerable amount of demoralization uh the united states is demoralized mainly because of its defeat in vietnam the final american forces withdraw from vietnam in 1975 uh, also the watergate scandal does a, you know a huge amount of damage to america politically on the international on the international scene 
Um, I think it's fair to say that Carter is not <laughs> regarded as being one of the more successful American presidents. Um, I think somewhat unfairly. I mean, I think when you look at his uh, his foreign policy record, it's not as bad as some of his critics try to make out. Um, he does, uh, you know, he does chalk up a couple of quite significant successes, probably the most important of which is the Camp David Agreement between Israel and Egypt, which basically brings an end to these two countries' state of war. Uh, and plays a really important role in terms of sort of stabilizing the situation in the Middle East. Um, equally, uh, Carter manages to successfully um, negotiate with the government of Panama um, um, and, and, and get Congress to accept uh, uh, America's withdrawal in terms of the canal in Panama, which, you know, was a, which, was actually quite a tricky and quite delicate diplomatic situation. So as I say, one or two, you know, relatively significant successes. Unfortunately, these are rather overshadowed by several major foreign policy failures, the most significant of which was almost certainly the Iranian Revolution in 1979. Iran, a major country um, in the Middle East, uh, which until 1979 had been a very close ally of the United States, a very important strategic partner. You have the Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini comes to power, and overnight uh, the United States finds itself locked into a relationship of mutual host hostility. Um, and then shortly after the revolution, um, the American embassy in Tehran is seized, um, its diplomats are taken hostage, and this leads to a very sort of protracted diplomatic and political crisis with Iran, which ultimately dooms Carter's presidency. Uh, there are several other uh, setbacks as well, including, I think, quite you know, a significant moment is the Soviets' decision to invade Afghanistan, Christmas Day, 1979 which again is seen as a sort of major setback in terms of um, American-Soviet relations. So for all these things, these things basically dooms Carter's presidency and you know, he loses the 1980 presidential election to Ronald Reagan. Um, another thing to mention before we get on to some of the specifics in terms of the transatlantic relationship is that America's economic situation in the 70s wasn't good and that too plays quite an important role, I would say, in terms of undermining Carter's popularity and his position as as president. Okay, um, in terms of his foreign policy, point number one here, Carter begins to pursue a policy that becomes known as trilateralism. Um, and that's significant because Carter is explicit in wanting to improve uh, America's relations with its allies. So trilateralism basically meant America would work with its partners in Europe and Japan. Um, a second element of Carter's foreign policy, which is more controversial, is that he basically places human rights at the center of his of, of, of his foreign policy, which inevitably causes strains with the Soviet Union. Um, and Carter never se seems to really acknowledge that, you know, that there was a fundamental tension between, on the one hand, wanting to taunt with the Eastern Bloc and on the other hand, sort of consistently attacking them uh, on their human rights record. Um, third point, which I've already mentioned, are, 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 are you know, these uh, are his sort of modest uh, um, successes, but overshadowed by these failures. In terms of the European situation, so we're talking mid to late 1970s. Um, I think it's fair to say that detente begins to weaken and the Cold War begins to intensify in this period. One of the factors behind this is that the Soviets decide to deploy a medium range missile in Eastern Europe. Medium range meaning that it was going to be targeted against European countries. So, yeah, so these missiles would be launched against London, Paris, Rome. So it was a missile, as I said, very much directed against the Europeans. And this, I think, heightens the European sense of vulnerability. Um, as interesting as to why the Soviets do this, I mean, the Soviets had sort of been launching from time to time peace offensives, trying to create a schism between Western Europe and the, and, and the United States. And yet, by deploying this missile, they effectively um, 
induced the Europeans to sort of rediscover the virtues of NATO. It brings the Americans and the Europeans back together. So whereas in the late 1960s, early 70s, you know, many Europeans are questioning, do we need NATO? It's, NATO served its presence, uh, served its purpose um, with the taunt and everything, with the stabilization in East-West relations, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the Cold War is actually now drawing to a close. Well, by the late 70s, as I say, uh, and partly as a consequence of, of the deployment of this missile, um, the Europeans, as I say, sort of rediscover the virtue of NATO's. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, there's a debate, let's say, as to why the Soviets do this, and uh, maybe, maybe uh, for reasons of time, I won't go off on that particular tangent. Um, NATO basically responds to this by opting for what becomes known as a dual track strategy. So they decide that they will negotiate with the Soviets to try and persuade them to withdraw these missiles. But whilst doing so, they will actually plan and eventually deploy their own medium range missiles. So if the negotiations fail to fail to be successful, then Europeans would have their own equivalent missiles stationed against the Soviet Union. So this was a you know this was a mechanism to try and put pressure on the Soviets to to to, to come to an agreement. Um, moreover, it's in this period that you begin to see a sort of remilitarization of the Cold War in Europe. Carter uh, makes a public uh, uh, um, uh, promise to start increasing American defense expenditure by five percent a year. So basically, American rearmament begins under Carter, sort of accelerated under Reagan, but or, but. America was already beginning to rearm under the Carter administration in the early, in, sorry, in the in, in the mid to late 1970s. Um, the deployment of medium range mis NATO missiles, the so cruise and Pershing missiles, was very controversial inside Europe as well. Um, politically, a number of parties on the left in Europe sort of violently opposed to the deployment of, of more American missiles in, in, in Europe. Uh, this is particularly true in Germany, but not just Germany, in Britain too, it becomes, you know, as I say, very, very controversial. Um, but the Social Democrats ultimately uh, come out, or they ultimately sort of, I say, they ultimately split on the issue of, uh, on the issue of this. Um, just one final, I'm just talking a little, I haven't put it on the slide here, but it's worth mentioning in passing. Um, yeah, the West German Chancellor's relationship, uh, Helmut Schmidt, his relationship with Carter was particularly poor um, in the late 70s. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, Car that Schmidt did not have a great deal of confidence in Carter's leadership. Um, the Lundestad chapter goes into this in some details, so maybe I won't labour this point, but you do have incidents like the neutron bomb, uh, the, the proposed deployment of a neutron bomb on German soil, uh, which ultimately is cancelled, but which also sort of shakes Schmidt's relationship uh, or, or shakes his belief in Carter. So yeah, relations between Schmidt and Carter were were, were pretty poor. Um, on the other hand, Carter's relationship with other European leaders tended to be much better, uh, um, particularly with the British Prime Minister of the late 1970s, James Callaghan. Right, um, quotation here, which I've taken, taken from an article, which uh, again sort of illustrates the fact that Germany was felt that it could now pursue a sort of more independent policy. This concerns um, a sort of case of the West Germans um, selling nuclear technology to Brazil, which the Americans were unhappy about. Um, and I won't read all the quotation, but uh, you know, he says, you know, he talks about. The Americans argue that you know the Germans should be sort of working through various consultative mechanisms, um, and uh, Schmidt replying here that you know these mechanisms worked as long as all partners agreed that the only relevant voice was that of the United States. This is no longer the case. Furthermore, American problems have changed. Uh, at the time in the 1960s, the U.S. had its hands full with containing Soviet influence in the world. Today, the U.S. is cooperating with the USSR. So again, kind of talking about how the current international environment has changed. And both are attempting to restrain their allies. The Chancellor recalled, and then he goes on to talk about the sort of deal with Brazil. But it sort of reflects the fact that, you know, by the 1970s, sort of the superpower relationship has has changed and that to some extent that this has impacted upon America's relations with its European allies.
the end of Deton. I think this is the two more. Another slide. Okay. Um, yeah, Deton basically kind of comes to an end, and I always say that it's Afghanistan, which is basically the last nail in Deton's coffin at the end of 1979. There are other areas which, you know, other factors which strained the American-Soviet relationship, particularly Soviet activities in the Third World, uh, particularly in Africa. Cuba sends troops to Angola. The Soviets are quite active on the Horn of Africa in the late 1970s, which you know the Americans find problematic. We mentioned the Iranian Revolution as well, which very much undermines Carter's authority. But as I say, it's the invasion to Afghanistan, which uh, which essentially brings Detente to, uh, to an end. From the American perspective, this is unvarnished Soviet aggression. Uh, and in response, the Americans impose quite severe sanctions against the Soviet Union. Um, more symbolically, the United States decides that it is going to boycott the Moscow Olympics in 1980. The Soviets do the same in the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984, uh -huh, which is the first Olympics I actually remember, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, leading to two of the most important, two of the most boring um, Olympic Games in, in the history. The uh, United States also starts covertly supplying weapons to the Mujahideen, uh, which, uh, you know, at the time proves to be pretty successful uh, in the sense that ultimately, by the end of the 1980s, the Soviet feels that it has no option but to withdraw from Afghanistan. Um, 20 years later, though, uh, some question the wisdom of whether supplying um, weapons to radical Islamicists, whether that was necessarily in the long term best interests of the United States. But anyway, we'll leave that for another time. Um, Carter Doctrine is also unveiled in, in 1979, in which he, he says publicly the United States would oppose any further Soviet, mu Soviet move into the Persian Gulf. Um, and again, that stems from the fact that the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan is sort of in is viewed as a sort of geopolitical move towards towards the Middle East. Um, European responses, I think there is something of a contrast um, in terms of in terms of the American and European responses to Afghanistan. Um, in general, I think the European response is more measured. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, who would recently become prime minister in 1979, she is the most supportive of the European leaders. France and Germany, though, and I think Lundestad mentions this, issue a statement saying that another crisis like Afghanistan would kill Detente. The implication being that the Soviet invasion had not in itself killed Detente. Helmut Schmidt later says, you know, we will not permit 10 years of detente in defence policy to be destroyed by this. So, so, you know, the Europeans rather more reluctant to bring to an end the detente uh, action. So there is something of a, as I say, something of a contrast. Later on, um, I think the House Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations Committee in the US Congress talks about the fact that uh, you know, the reactions of America's European allies have been found wanting. So, so, so there the, the does seem you know, something of a division does sort of open up between the two sides on this. Um, Germany does try to play some kind of mediation role between the two superpowers, and France also sort of maintains its context with the Soviet Union. So, as I said, the European reaction is rather more restrained uh, to to Afghanistan, and in general, I think there was a less of a uh, of an inclination to allow detente to completely undermined um, as a consequence of uh, of Afghanistan. I would say even the British actually under Margaret Thatcher, uh, although as I say more supportive of Reagan, even the British um, are don't feel that completely breaking with the Soviets is 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 necessarily a particularly good idea. Okay, um, yes, this went on for rather longer than I intended, but yeah, we we. Had to get through quite a lot of material from the 1970s is quite a uh, quite a busy decade um so yeah i will conclude on that